Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and today we will be learning about five different agents of evolution. That is, the different factors that can change the gene pool of a population, which then leads to the evolution of the population. Now, when Charles Darwin wrote and published on the origin of species back in 1859, he didn't know anything about genetics. To be fair, pretty much no one knew anything about genetics, with the exception maybe of Gregor Mendel, who was working on his pea plant experiments between 1856 and 1863, so around the time that Darwin had published Origin. There is evidence that Mendel knew a lot about Darwin and had even read on the origin of species. However, Darwin knew nothing of Mendel and his discoveries about the inheritance of traits. What Darwin knew was that variation in a trait was required for natural selection to occur, and he knew that the trait needed to be passed down to offspring, but he didn't really know about genes or alleles. That understanding came to biologists later with the discovery of DNA. So now we understand that the variation in a population that is required for natural selection to happen is actually in fact due to a variation in the alleles for a particular gene found in a particular population. A population, of course, is a group of interbreeding individuals. A population will have a gene pool. A gene pool is a collection of all the alleles that are found in the population. So let's recall the difference between the terms alleles and genes. In simplest terms, a gene is a section of the DNA code that codes for a particular trait. So let's say in this population of beetles that you see right here. The gene that we could focus on would be the gene that determines the beetle coloration. All the beetles have that gene in their DNA. And all the beetles, each of them, have two copies of the gene. One they inherited from mom and one they inherited from dad. But there is genetic variation for that particular gene in this population. As a matter of fact, there are two possible alleles for that gene. A dominant allele that codes for brown coloration which will be denoted by a capital B, and a recessive allele that codes for green coloration, denoted by a lowercase b. We can actually quantify or count how common each of those alleles are in the gene pool of this beetle population. In other words, how many big B and how many little b alleles there are. So in this population, there are six beetles, each of them with two copies of the gene. That means that there are a total of 12 alleles for color in this population. Three of the beetles are brown, but as you can see, each of them is heterozygous for that trait. So, only three of the 12 alleles are the big B allele, which means that 25% of the alleles in this population are the big B allele. Then, nine of the 12, or 75% of the alleles in this population are the little B allele. Evolution is defined as the change in heritable traits of a population over time. In other words, evolution is a change in the genetic composition over time. So evolution happens when there is a change in the frequency of the different alleles in a population's gene pool. In this particular case, we can see that in the first generation of beetles, 75% of the alleles were the green allele, and 25% of the alleles in the population were the brown allele. But in the second generation, there's a change in the frequency of these alleles in the population, and now 71% of the alleles are green, and 29% of the alleles are brown. This population is changing as the brown allele is becoming more common in the population from one generation to the next. So, so far, we've focused quite a bit on Darwin's theory of evolution by means of natural selection, which is still viewed as the primary mechanism by which change in allele frequency can happen. But it is important to note that this is not the only cause for change in allele frequencies in a population. There are actually five different mechanisms, or ways by which the gene pool changes that lead to evolution of a population can occur. These five agents of evolutionary change are sometimes called the five fingers of evolution. So let's start with mutations, the ultimate source of genetic variation in a population. Evolution is all about change in inherited traits over time. So that means that the physical and behavioral changes that make evolution possible happens only when the DNA code for a gene changes. And these changes are called mutations. Mutations are essentially the raw material on which evolution acts. 
a mutation could cause parents with genes for bright green coloration to suddenly have an offspring with a gene for brown coloration. This would then change the allele frequency in the gene pool and make genes for brown coloration more frequent in the population than there were before the mutation. What is important, though, is that you understand that mutations are random. Mutations can be harmful, they can be neutral, they can even be beneficial for the organisms. But mutations do not try to supply what the organism needs. Whether a particular mutation happens or not is unrelated to how useful that mutation would be to the population. And most of the time, mutations have harmful effects on the organism. They usually lead to disease or malformed organisms that can't survive as well. Sometimes mutations have a neutral effect on the organism, causing no change in their survival ability. And since mutations are basically just random changes in DNA, rarely are those changes beneficial to the organism. Also, most mutations occur in somatic cells, not in the gametes, meaning that they can affect the organism, but are not passed down to future generations. When mutations do occur in the gametes, they become inheritable mutations, ones that can be passed down to future generations, and when that happens, they can change the allele frequencies of a gene pool. And in the extremely rare case that a mutation is beneficial and happens to increase the fitness of an individual, that mutation would be selected for and over time significantly change the population, which can lead to evolution. For example, the Carbonaria trait in the peppered moth is due to a single gene mutation. This darkly colored moth was first discovered in 1811. On the lichen-covered trees that the moths frequented, the mutation was certainly a survival disadvantage since it caused the moths to be more visible to predators. The mutation did not occur because the environment changed. It was there already before it became beneficial to the organism. However, when the environment did change, the trait suddenly became beneficial by providing camouflage. After the environment change, the number of dark-colored moths in the population increased significantly to as high as 98% of the population of moths in certain areas by 1895. The ultimate source of the genetic variation that produced two different colored moths, however, was just a random mutation. Another mechanism by which allele frequencies might change in a population is migration. Some individuals from a population of, say, brown beetles might have joined a population of green beetles. That would make the genes for brown coloration more frequent in the green beetle population than they were before the brown beetles migrated into it. Any movement of individuals or the genetic material that they carry from one population to another is called gene flow. Gene flow includes lots of different kinds of events, like in this case with beetles moving from one population to another. But it can also describe the movement of gametes or embryos. For example, pollen or seeds being moved by the wind or by animals to a new destination. A third agent of evolutionary change is non-random mating. Non-random mating happens when the chances of an individual passing on its genes in the next generation through mating is not equal. For example, some individuals in the population could have a reproductive advantage through sexual selection. Let's say that in this beetle population, brown beetles are more attractive and therefore get to reproduce more often than green beetles. And as a result, the brown coloration becomes more frequent in the population after each successive generation. Non-random mating could also be due to something called assortative mating. During assortative mating, similar types of individuals in a population mate more frequently with each other than with dissimilar types. So in this example, the green beetles only mate with green beetles and the brown beetles only mate with brown beetles. A fourth factor that can affect the gene pools of a population is called genetic drift, and it's something that can have a greater effect when the population is small. Now imagine you have a population of nine beetles. Three are green and six are brown. Two of the green beetles are killed by someone stepping on them before they even manage to reproduce. Just by chance, a change in the allele frequency of the population has happened. The next generation would have a few more brown beetles than the previous generation as a result of this. So these random changes from generation to generation are called genetic drift. The allele frequency of the population changed significantly in just one generation. And the reason for that change was just a random event. 
Had the foot landed on two brown beetles instead, the change in the population would have been significantly different. Random deaths can occur in any population, of course. However, the effects of these events on the allele frequency of a population is more pronounced when the population is small to start with. If instead of a population of 9 beetles, we had started with a population of 900 beetles, 300 green and 600 brown, and instead of 2 beetles being stepped on, 200 of them are stepped on, it would then be highly unlikely that all the 200 dead beetles would be green just by simply random luck. With an initial population of 900, it would be more likely that the dead beetles would be a mixture of both brown and green beetles, with actually more of the dead ones being brown because there are more brown beetles in the population to start with. But let's now imagine that these beetles spend their time on brown tree trunks. Green beetles would then be easier for birds to spot and hence eat. The brown beetles are a little more likely to survive and become more common in the population because they're able to produce more offspring. And over successive generations, the allele frequency of brown beetles continues to increase. This is natural selection in a nutshell and is the main mechanism for evolution. One of the most commonly cited examples of natural selection is a case that we already discussed, the case of industrial melanism and the peppered moth. A once rare melanic or dark variety of peppered moth became the most common type within a few decades. By now, you know the story. The soot-covered tree suddenly provided the darker moths with a survival advantage over the lighter moths, and then the reverse event happened after a Clean Air Act was enacted in the 1950s, which lowered pollution in the areas where the peppered moth lives. The lichen that once covered the trees and made them white started to grow again, and the black soot no longer settled on the barks of the trees. And as expected, the light pepper moth population started to become more common as it gained a survival advantage. So the main idea behind natural selection is that the individuals in the population that get to survive and reproduce is not random. The individuals with the traits that provides the best adaptation, those traits that increase fitness, those individuals are the ones that get to survive more often, reproduce more often, pass on more of their genes to the next generation, and slowly change the allele frequency of the population. Both genetic drift and natural selection are mechanisms by which a population can evolve. But genetic drift is completely different than natural selection because it is all about random changes in the population. It's not about selection. It doesn't matter whether the traits increase fitness or not. Individuals either survive and get to reproduce or not survive and don't get to reproduce simply due to random events. And these random events have a greater effect on small populations. So in biology, there are two types of mechanisms that cause genetic drift by significantly reducing the population. One is called the founder effect, and the other, the bottleneck effect. The founder effect happens when a few individuals leave a large population to found a new colony somewhere else. If the new colony is genetically isolated from the original population, the genetic diversity of the new population will be different than the original population. For example, let's say we have a population with roughly half yellow and half red beetles. A small group of these beetles moved to a remote island. Maybe they were flying and got caught up in a strong wind and were blown away and landed on this island. The island is too far from the original land to fly back to, so the beetles are stuck there and they form a new population, which we call a colony. By random chance, the few beetles that got dropped in the island are all red. This new island population has lost the genetic diversity and color from the original population and has a different allele frequency in its gene pool. We can find many examples of the founder effect in human populations. As a matter of fact, many genetic diseases have an increased prevalence in certain human populations due in part to the founder effect. This can happen when small populations of humans are either forcibly separated or leave the larger genetic gene pool by choice to settle somewhere else. If even one member of this small group of settlers has or is a carrier of a rare genetic disorder, the disorder can be passed on to their descendants and lead to a higher incidence of the disease amongst them. For example, the prevalence of Huntington's disease among the Afrikaner population in South Africa is much higher than in the general population 
due to the fact that when the Dutch settlers landed in South Africa in the 1650s, one of them had Huntington's disease and was able to pass that on to his descendants. Another example is the much higher incidence of polydactyly in the Amish population than there is in the general population. And as a final example is the disproportionate percentage of the population living on Martha's Vineyard, an island off the southeastern coast of Massachusetts that is affected by a hereditary form of deafness. The overall rate of vineyard deafness peaked in the 19th century at an estimated 1 in every 155 islanders, which is far exceeding the rate of deafness in the American population generally. So the other main mechanism that leads to genetic drift is called the bottleneck effect. A population bottleneck can happen when a population is significantly reduced in size by some chance, often catastrophic event that randomly kills most of the members of a population and leads only a few survivors to make up the gene pool for future generations. For example, a volcanic eruption, a forest fire, or some sort of extreme weather event killing most of a population and leaving only a few random survivors. But it could also be caused by human actions, like overhunting of a population that significantly reduces the numbers. And the reason that it is called the bottleneck is because it can be described with the analogy of a bottle that is filled with different colored marbles. The marbles represent different individuals in a population and the variety of colors through genetic variation. If a catastrophic or bottleneck event occurs, only a few random individuals survive, which can then be illustrated by dumping a few random marbles from the original bottle out into a new container. The few surviving members of the population will not have an equal representation of the genetic variation in the original population. Some traits may randomly be overrepresented, and some may not even be present at all, and those alleles will then disappear. As the population once again increases in numbers, it will look different than the original population, because all of them will be descendants of the few individuals that survived the original population. And since the surviving population is small, other random events, or genetic drift, like some individuals not finding a mate or dying in an accident, can then further decrease the genetic variation in this small population before it gets to become big again. There are quite a few examples of populations with low genetic diversity as a result of a population bottleneck. For example, cheetahs. Cheetahs are well known for having extremely low genetic diversity. So much so that organs can be transplanted between any two cheetahs without fear of rejection. This lack of genetic diversity is actually not a good thing. It causes the cheetahs to have reproductive difficulties. Apparently, male cheetahs tend to produce a very high percentage, about 70%, of sperm with abnormal structure and low motility. Cheetahs actually went through two genetic drift events. Evidence suggests that today's cheetah, which is found only in Africa, actually originated in North America and crossed over to Asia via land bridge 100,000 years ago before dispersing to Africa. So one of the suggestions has been that this Asian dispersal may have caused the first genetic drift. So a founder effect lowered the diversity of the African cheetah because they are all descendants of the few individuals that managed to migrate to Africa. Then a second genetic drift event occurred about 12,000 years ago which happens to coincide with the late Pleistocene extinctions, during which many large-bodied mammals, including the American cheetahs, went extinct around the world. Researchers hypothesized that these extinctions were caused by climate change, overhunting by humans, or a combination of both. So these two separate genetic drift events significantly reduced the population of the cheetahs and therefore reduced their genetic variation to the point that nowadays cheetahs have some of the lowest genetic diversity of any animal. Northern elephant seals have reduced genetic variation probably because of a population bottleneck humans inflicted on them in the 1890s. Hunting reduced their population size from over 100,000 to as few as 20 individuals by some accounts. Once their hunting was prohibited, the population slowly increased again and is now at about 127,000. However, the population bottleneck they went through has significantly reduced genetic variation from the original population since every one of those 127,000 seals is a descendant from a group of 20 seals. And here's a final example. 
It is generally believed that about 60 million North American bison, commonly known as buffalo, existed in the Great Plains before the European settlement. Overhunting by humans reduced that number of buffalo to just 750 by 1890. The population has recovered somewhat after that, and by the year 2000, an estimated 360,000 bison roamed free. However, their genetic diversity is likely to have been significantly reduced from that original population of 60 million, because every single one of those 360,000 bison is a descendant of a much smaller gene pool. So to summarize, natural selection is not the only mechanism that can lead to evolution. Instead of selection, the change could be due to random events like population bottlenecks or the founder effect, which are more likely to have an effect on small populations. We call that genetic drift. Also, sexual selection, or any other type of non-random mating, can lead to changes in allele frequencies in a population. Gene flow, or any type of migration, can change allele frequencies by moving genes in and out of a population. And finally, the ultimate source of any new genes is mutations. Without mutations as a source of genetic variation, evolution could not occur at all. And so that's it for today's lesson. Talk to you soon.